Hello, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker. Listen, uh, if there are only two books in your Christian library, this should be one of them. Webster, 1828, Dictionary of the English Language. You can pick it up for about $85. Let me re let you uh, learn a little bit about Webster. His name was Noah Webster. He was from Connecticut. And uh, he went to Yale, which was Connecticut's very first college. For those of you that don't know it, Yale, Harvard, and Princeton were all founded as Bible colleges, not the sick, disgusting things that they are now. Matter of fact, Harvard offers a class in anal sex. I bet you they didn't teach that back when Harvard was founded as a Christian college. But he went to Yale when he was 16 years old and graduated in four years. You know, he wanted to study law, but, hey, he couldn't afford it, like so many of us. But uh, so he got a job as a teacher. But he realized that the American educational system needed to be updated and upgraded. I mean, you know, most, most schools of those days, everybody was crammed into one-room schoolhouses. Some of them had no desks poor books. Some of the teachers were not even trained. And a lot of the books came from England, which, you know, you got to realize this is right after the American Revolution. And Webster believed that Americans should learn from American books. He wrote a, a textbook called The Grammatical Institute of the English Language, they called it the blue back black blue backed speller because it had a blue cover. And for over a hundred years, it was this book that taught children how to read and spell and pronounce words. It was the most popular American book of its time. And it sold around 100 million copies. They didn't get rid of that until the progressive liberal movement in the 20s and the 30s started taking effect. Now, Noah wanted to standardize the spelling of the English language. I mean, you had people that would spell the same word three or four different ways. Uh, take, for example, the name Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Then you had others that would spell it S-M-Y-T-H. Uh, color, C-O-L-O-R. The English spell it C-O-L-O-U-R. Music, we spell it M-U-S-I-C. In the Bible, in Old English, it was spelled M-U-S-I-C-K. Mu-sick, like you were ill. So, and even if you used an English Bible from England, uh, the word skunk wasn't in there because England doesn't have skunks. You know, the creatures that'll uh, make you smell bad, you know. And squash. England didn't have squash. The, you know, the, the vegetable. So it took him over 20 years to finish the American Dictionary of the English Language, which was published in 1828. If you can get an original copy of Webster's 1828 Dictionary, that is probably the most important book outside of the Bible that you could own. Webster, and a lot of his dictionary, uh, in his dictionary, a lot of his word definitions actually reference, have references and cite the actual Bible scripture where it is mentioned at. I mean, the guy was an incredible scholar. Webster knew Greek, which is what the New Testament, he, uh, New Testament language, what the language that the New Testament was written in. He knew Hebrew, which is what basically the Old Testament was written in. He knew Latin. He knew Spanish, German, French, Italian. 
I mean, the guy knew, I heard he knew over 20-something languages fluently. The guy was a, a scholar. I wish I knew half of what he knew, or a quarter even. And when you look up his Bible, def, uh, a word in the Bible, the Bible definition, they're spot on. They're perfect as far as I'm concerned. Uh, according to Wikipedia, and this is pretty much backs up what I've learned too, uh, Webster learned 28 languages, including Old English, which was Anglo-Saxon. And I'll tell you what, if you get an, ang uh, an, uh, an uh, Saxon Bible, you can't read it. Uh, it's just, uh, look at the original uh, Beowulf. Yeah, for those of you that went to college, uh, you know, I took English or English literature, and you can't read it. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, five, six, seven hundred year old English, but it doesn't look like English. He learned Gothic, German, Greek, which I said, you know, the New Testament was written in Greek, Latin, which uh, quite a few words come from Latin. Uh, let's see, Italian, Spanish, and French all derive from Latin. He knew Italian, Spanish, French, Dutch, Welsh. Welsh is a sub-language of the United Kingdom. He knew Russian, Hebrew, which is the Old Testament, Aramaic. Parts of the Old Testament were written in Aramaic. He knew Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit, which is uh, uh, India. So this guy was, I mean, he knew the root languages. And for those of you that tell you that, uh, like, we shouldn't use Latin words in the Bible, you'll hear people like James White that says, well, Lucifer doesn't belong in the Bible in Isaiah 14 because it's a Latin word, and, and we don't speak Latin. Well, okay, did you know that surveillance is French? Espionage, espionage is French. Uh Taco is Spanish. Burrito is Spanish. Maybe we shouldn't use those words because, hey, they're not English, right? Don't listen to those morons. I had a college professor tell me that the English language uh, has at least between 20 to 25 percent of English words derive from Latin. So when you hear somebody like James White telling you that Lucifer doesn't belong in the Bible, because it's a Latin word, well, quit using French and Spanish words, you know, quit using them, you know, what can I tell you? And oh, by the way, Webster was a Christian. He believed in orthodoxy. He was a, uh, a, a devout congregationalist. The Congregationalist, uh, Congregationalist Church is not real large today, but he preached that we needed to Christianize the United States. And uh, when they start telling you about separation of church and state, just remember something. The American Bible Society printed Bibles where they placed them in schools and in public libraries. Well, they didn't call them libraries back then. They were I think they called them like reading societies or something. They were the precursor to public libraries. And uh, the American Bible Society. Do you know who founded the American Bible Society? The United States Congress did. They took public money, gave it to the, created the American Bible Society, gave them money, printed Bibles, and placed them in what would become public libraries and schools. The New Testament. Until you had the so-called Supreme Court that took the Bible and prayer in Jesus' name out of the public schools where it had been for 200 and something years. They said, oh, it'll warp the minds of the children. Yeah, the, the Ten Commandments and reading about the, the love of Jesus is going to warp the minds of the children. So, yeah, in 1960, we had under 1,000 murders in the United States. Last year, Chicago alone had 762 murders. So uh, warping the children's mind has really worked 
not warping the children's minds has really worked really well for the uh, so-called liberals that hate Jesus. Webster considered education useless without the Bible. In 1833, he even uh, updated the King James Version and um, uh, uh, updated the language. He didn't make a new translation. He just updated the language. Uh, do you know what kine is? K-I-N-E? Well, he took that. That's an archaic English word for cattle. So he took kine, K-I-N-E, and he updated it and said cattle or cow. You know, he just updated the language. And, uh, but it, the, the, the Webster's Bible never really caught on. So, you know, what can I tell you? Uh, let's see. Webster also helped to found Amherst College. So, all right, let's take a look at some Bible words that, uh, definitions. All right, suppose you're reading Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, and you read the following. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood? What in the world does that word mean? Propitiation, Webster's Dictionary, noun, the act of appeasing wrath. You know how to appease somebody's wrath? Um, well, it's to, to make somebody that's mad at you and you do something nice for them, you know. The act of appeasing wrath and Conciliating the favor of an offended person, the act of making pro propitious. In theology, see, right here, he's going to explain what it means. The atonement or atoning sacrifice, that's what Christ was, the atonement or atoning sacrifice offered to God to assuage his wrath and render him propitious to sinners. Christ is the propitiation for the sins of men. It means to appease wrath. Uh, you know, your neighbor's mad at you. You bake them a cake. You deliver it to them, you know, and they're like, all right. You know, or two guys get mad at each other and you buy them a, a case of beer or something. I don't know. I don't drink beer, but, you know, that's all... That's, that's the gift most guys would like. All right. Uh, suppose you're reading Hebrews 10.10, which says, by the, by the which we, I'm sorry, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Say, hmm, what does sanctified mean? Well, Webster's 1828, sanctified, a participle, passive. First definition, to be made holy, consecrated, set apart for sacred services. So we are made holy by the which we will we are sanctified or made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Isn't that wonderful? So, I'm a very, very strong believer in Webster's Dictionary. And it doesn't hurt to have a, a hard copy. You know, uh, you never know when the Internet's not going to work anymore. You know, and, and uh, so that's the first, uh, that's one book I think you should have. The second other book that you should definitely have is a King James Bible. And, uh, you know, they'll, the Geneva Bible is an okay Bible, too. It's a good Bible. There's nothing wrong with it. The Webster's Bible's nothing's wrong with it either. It just never caught on. 
But the uh, what people don't like about the Geneva Bibles, the notes, you know, personally, I would just get a giant or a large print plain King James Bible. And you got to be careful because the modern printers, for example, Zondervan is the largest English language publisher of religious books in the world. And it's owned by Harper Collins, which prints the Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan. They also print the Joy of Gay Sex. So Zondervan, a so-called Christian company, is owned by Harper Collins that prints gay porn and Church of Satan material. And they also are the exclusive printer of the NIV Bible, which is basically uses the same manuscripts as the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower Bible, the New World Order translation, which is uh, the manuscripts that they use are the, uh, the Vatican manuscripts. So, hey, if you want an NIV or any of the modern Bibles, just go to the Catholic Church and get yourself a Bible from them because it's the same thing. They use the Catholic manuscripts, which are the so-called minority texts, there's less than 5% of the manuscripts are the, what they call the minority text. The majority text, 95%, over 5,000-something manuscripts, are called the majority text, also called the Byzantine text, the, um, the textus receptus, or the received text. It was the text used by the Greek church. That's for the New Testament. Then you got the tradi traditional Hebrew Masoretic text, which is for the Old Testament. And that's what the King James, the Geneva, and the Webster Bibles follow. All the modern Bibles use the Vatican manuscripts. If you want a modern Bible, become a Catholic. It's as simple as that. If you're going to use a Catholic Bible, use a Catholic Bible. But if you consider yourself non-Catholic, and I'm not saying Protestant, because I'm, I'm not protesting the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church left the faith a long time ago. There was a time the Catholic Church, the Church of Rome, actually did some good things, but that was a long, long, long time ago. But the, uh, the King James Bible it has a built-in dictionary. Oftentimes, not always, but usually, like, if you're looking for a word... The first, usually the first time the word appears in the King James Bible, when you read the context, like that particular paragraph that it appears in, it'll explain what the word means. For example, in the King James, the word seer, S-E-E-R, you know, it means to see. Now, that's another thing, too. When you look in the Bible and you don't, you're not sure what a word means, let's, when it says, oh, let us sit down for meat, M-E-A-T. I mean, you could be eating bread, but you're sitting down for meat. Uh, meat back then meant to have food. But if you look in the word M-E-A-T, meat, there's the word eat. And that's what it means. It doesn't necessarily mean have a steak or a lamb or, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily have the same context that it means today. So if somebody invited you back in the days of the King James Bible to sit down for meat, you might have a vegetarian dinner, but yet you were sitting down for meat. But if you look in the word E-A-T, you know, so... Um, Let's take a look at the word seer, S-E-E-R. If you look in it, you see the word see, S-E-E, -E, as in vision, your eyes. So where's the first time that this word appears? It appears for the first time in 1 Samuel chapter 9, and verse 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire, what does it mean to inquire? It means to go and ask. When a man went to inquire of God, Thus he spake, Come, 
and let us go to the seer. Okay. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So a seer would be called, would, the modern usage would be, oh, he's a prophet. But before they changed, you know, he, they were called prophets, they were called seers. See, the Bible explains to you what it means. So when you read the word prophet later on, you'll say, oh, that was the old time usage of the word, you know, seer was the old time usage of the word. So, you know, and, and if you're not sure what a word means, you sometimes you can look inside the word and, in, and it'll be embedded a, a hint of what the word means. The modern Bibles don't do that. They can't. They have to use different words because of the copyright laws. Uh, they have to be, they have to use different words. Now, in the United States, the King James Bible is not copyrighted. Anybody can print the King James Bible. Now, if you go to England, yes, the crown, the English royalty, the royal family owns the uh, copyright on the King James Bible. But, you know, if you uh, stand up for the King James Bible, they'll, they'll accuse you of being in a cult. Oh, you're one of those King James only people. You're in a cult. Well, you know, they can't. I, that's what they have to do. They have to call you names because they can't prove you wrong. And that's what these wicked, evil people will do. They will call you names because they can't prove you wrong. For example, in Isaiah 14, in the uh, complete Jewish Bible and the NIV, there's a guy who fell from heaven and is going down to the pit to be covered with worms. His name is the Morning Star. Okay? So, in Isaiah 14, when you read that chapter, the Morning Star is a bought bad guy. He rebelled against God. He's being cast down to the pit. Like I say, covered with worms. He's not a good, he's not a good person. That's the complete Jewish Bible, which is a so-called Messianic Jew that supposedly believes in Yeshua. Well, he, they, they want you to think Yeshua is Jesus. I have my doubts. But the NIV Bible does the same thing. The morning star fell from heaven. Fell from heaven in Isaiah 14, going down to the pit. Where's the pit? The pit of hell. But then when you go to Revelation chapter 22, who is this morning star? Uh, Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. Jesus says he's the morning star. Uh, did Jesus fall from heaven and is going down to the pit of hell? Well, throw away your complete Jewish Bible. Throw away your NIV. Get yourself a King James because the King James Bible will tell you. Lucifer fell from heaven. But then idiots, heretics like James White will tell you, ah, well, Lucifer is a Latin word. It doesn't belong in the Bible. Well, like I said, surveillance and espionage are French words. They're not common words, but, you know, taco, burrito, don't use them. They're Spanish words. They don't belong in the English language, right? Well, guess what? Like I said, a college professor told me 20 to 25% of the English language words derived from Latin. You ever heard of ultra? That's Latin. You ever heard of corpse, as in dead body? Latin. Uh, lumen, illuminate, you know, to light, make something light. Latin words. So, you know, the thing is, James White doesn't know who Lucifer is. 
But if you go and, and type in Church of the Luciferians, L-U-C-I-F-E-R-I-A-N-S, Luciferians are people that worship Lucifer. They're followers of Lucifer. They know who Lucifer is. They know Lucifer is the devil and Satan. It's only heretics like James White that don't know who Lucifer is. You know, they call us Christians, followers of Christ, Luciferians. Follow Satan, the devil. I mean, how hard is that to figure out? So, that's my opinion. Webster's 1828 Dictionary and the King James Bible. Stick with it. Um, and if you have trouble understanding the King James Bible, well, turn your Bibles to James chapter 1. Let's take a look at James chapter 1. We'll read this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who James was? He was a guy. He grew up with... Um, he grew up with a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph. Yeah, he grew up with Jesus. His whole life, he grew up with Jesus. I think he knows a little, a couple of things. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes, what twelve tribes? The twelve tribes of Israel, people. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Isn't that funny? The demon nominational church doesn't know where the, the 12 tribes are, but James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, does. Verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Listen carefully. If any of you lack wisdom, do you lack wisdom when you read the Bible? Well, here's his advice. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask, let him ask of God. If you lack wisdom, ask God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. You got to ask in faith, people. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. The Lord wants us to be single minded toward him. He doesn't want you to have one foot in heaven and one foot on the earth. So, all right, well, boy, I tell you what, 30 minutes just to tell you to buy two books. Can, can you say, uh, Chaplain Bob, you are so long-winded. Well, what can I tell you? All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. And all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ. In his precious name, amen.